Hello and welcome to the Hard Sell, the program where the stick and the swill bucket rattles back. This is a special edition in more ways than one. For a start, we're mostly not looking at adverts this time around, although there are a few. Instead, we're paying tribute to someone who shaped our ideas of what advertising was for, or more accurately, branding, and was responsible in many ways for how not only our television has looked over the past 40 years, but through his influence, much of our world in general. Martin Lambie Nairn was born in Croydon and attended what is now known as the University of the Creative Arts, but then was just the Canterbury Art College. How did you get into art college? The normal way you get into art college, the same old usual boring normal way you get in. Failed me exams and applied. <laughs> <laughs> he snapped me up. From there, he went almost straight to the BBC as an assistant designer in 1965. He was quickly poached by Reader Fusion, and spent the next decade floating around the London archipelago of the ITV network in various designing capacities. First Reader Fusion, then a sojourn at ITN, where he created the iconic News at Ten wordmark, and finally an extended stay at London Weekend, where he really started to make his name. His first on-screen credit, according to IMDb at least, came on forgotten, grittier-than-thou crime drama anthology Villains, made by London Weekend in 1972, for which he presumably chose the hard-as-nail stencil lettering and porridge-played-straight title sequence. For the same company, he also designed Who Do You Do, which didn't stretch his talents very much at all, although he couldn't do much about the material. You know, darling, I'm a wonderful housekeeper. Every time I get a divorce, I keep the house. <laughs> all that at the nonchalantly racist sitcom Mind Your Language a couple of years later. Now he was getting his name in the credits of things, it was time to stretch himself beyond just what LWT had to offer. And he formed his own company with fellow London weekend escapee Colin Robinson, the logically named Robinson Lambie Nairn, to provide graphic design for anyone who needed it, which still tended to be LWT at this point. The weathered 17th century font on their 1979 Dick Turpin series was Lambie Nairn's doing. It was around this time that Lambie Nairn semi-accidentally created one of the most iconic comedy programmes of the 1980s. Peter Fluck and Roger Law, already famous for their startling sculptural caricatures, which had illustrated everything from the National Lampoon to Radio Times, were searching for some kind of television outlet for their talents. Early attempts, like the pilot version of Not On Nine O'Clock News, didn't quite work out. Of course, it's very difficult to see ahead. Oh, that's better. <laughs> and they'd all but given up altogether. Somehow, though, Lambie Nairn managed to reignite their enthusiasm and 
fire their imaginations in the direction of pure rubbery puppetry, even though both are on record as hating puppets. Lampinen was credited on every episode ever since, even the new series, which is about as good as it was in 1994 or so. Okay, let me ask you something else. Just how big do you think my willy is? The Zoom link is breaking up. You're not on Zoom. How big? I'm going to restart the connection. One of the company's biggest jobs early on, still for LWT, was the relaunch of Weekend World, their laser-sharp Sunday political review that had been launched by John Burt and Peter Jay as a demonstration of the hard news philosophy that later failed so miserably at TBAM. Robinson and Abby Nen were called in to relaunch it, when Jay stepped down as host to become ambassador to the United States, as you do. For a new era, fronted by Brian Walden, Lambie Nen and his company provided a dynamic new intro, combining geography, the alphabet, and furious progressive rock, complete with many-fingered organ and blistering electronic guitar, courtesy of Long Island early metalers Mountain. afternoon. Which admittedly was already the theme to you, but it fits this sort of thing much better. As you can see, this was when Lambie Nan became interested in the possibilities of computer graphics. It's even clearer in the second title sequence he and his company made for the show, which debuted in 1984, although it was made in and for 1983. It was so avant-garde and gaudy that LWT took fright and sat on it for a year. Hello and good afternoon. CGI provided a whole new way of seeing. You were no longer limited to things that could exist in the real world. Now the only limit was your imagination and budget and processor power and technology. But revolutions had to start somewhere, and Nabi Nan recognised this one was starting right under his nose. first got the chance when, to his own surprise, Robinson Lambie Nen made it to the final shortlist to create the identity of Britain's first wholly new national television station in over a quarter century, Channel 4. Lambie Nen and team latched on to the two main characteristics of the new channel. One, that it was a minority interest channel catering to niche audiences, and two, that they weren't going to make any programmes of their own, right to reply notwithstanding, but instead buy them in from independent production companies. So, Lambie Nen approached Channel 4 via the idea of different elements coming together to form a single thing. Not the easiest idea to impose on a shape as awkward as the number 4, but, as we all know, they eventually managed it. To their great delight, Robinson and Lambie Nen got the contract to effectively create Channel 4, or its image at least, by dint of their decade-plus experience in television, of which no other designers in the running had any. Even then they had a few struggles getting their ideas through. At one point Lambie Nen had to collate a scrapbook consisting of different versions of the figure 4 in serif, just to prove that the line at the bottom really was a thing. And the bright colours were another issue. To Lambie Nen, they were the whole point. 
illustrating the whole through many one idea. But certain executives at the nascent station thought they looked childish and would prevent the channel being taken seriously, and pushed for a sophisticated brushed chrome aesthetic, which ironically would become prevalent in the design's many, many, many imitators over the coming decade. Fortunately, Nambi Nan won that particular battle of wills. The final issue involved the animation itself. Channel 4's wasn't the first CGI ident in the UK, that was BBC Two's Worm. But it was the first that couldn't have been achieved any other way, and that was Lambie Nan's whole point. A whole new system had to be lashed up just to render it to the point of acceptability, if a little cartoonish. But that wasn't enough. Lambie Nan wanted it to look as real as possible with weight and shading and everything, and that kind of technology didn't exist yet, at least not in Britain. It necessitated outsourcing to the company at the very bleeding edge of CGI over in Los Angeles. Bogaring Aviation. It's a confusing name, but go with it. It was expensive and complicated and worth it. So anyway, we all know what happened next. Channel 4 had a logo and a concomitant identity that embedded itself into the national psyche and never left. Even in those early years, when everybody from the sun to private eye was making the same four viewers jokes, the one thing everyone agreed on was that logo was cool. So cool that over nearly 40 years, they've never dropped it, and it's distantly long odds they ever will. Oh, well, they tried. <laughs> This is Channel 4. They considered it multiple times, but they've always come back to the blocks and the serif 4 because it's so much who they are. The absolute most they've ever done is shave the blocks down a few years ago so there's a bit more air between them. You have to pay close attention to notice. There is no Channel 4 without that logo. And Lambie Nan's name was well and truly made. You're watching the work of Martin Lambie Nan, who sadly died on Christmas Day. Robinson Lambie Nan became, almost overnight, one of the biggest design and branding companies in the country, and eventually the world. With the business expanding globally until they had offices on just about every continent by the mid-90s. By then, Robinson had left, and the company was now Lambie Nairn and Company. Over the years, Lambie Nairn worked with companies like HSBC, Sainsbury's, and BT, where he came up with the name O2 to replace the essentially meaningless BT cell net. But television was always the first love of both the company and the man who gave it its name. And after what he achieved with Channel 4, every two-bit transmitter jockey in town was practically knifing each other to get him to reboot them from ITV franchises all the way up to the big one. Which is where we'll pick it up next time. watching a Bob the Fish production. Thanks! 
If you haven't found it already, be sure to check out our website at bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds of videos not unlike this one that will make you laugh, think and realise new things or your money back. Which works out great because they're all absolutely free. All of this is possible thanks to the not unique way that Bob the Fish productions are paid for by you, the viewing public, via Patreon. For a donation of as little as £1 a month, not only do you ensure that I still have food and shelter so I can carry on making these programmes, but you could become eligible for a whole host of cool extras. New video essays, special event live streams, all my content a week in advance, and my book on the history of the BBC, Rule the Waves, chapter by chapter as it's written. And some cake, if you go out and buy a cake and eat it while you're watching. And if you don't want to support on a monthly basis, you can make a one-off donation via coffee. It all helps stave off scurvy. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is.